what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I'm here with Kevin Horrigan of Spinia Tech. And before I formally introduce Kevin, Kevin, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out of the podcast. And um, Kevin, I know, is a huge fan of EOS. And so uh, people can check out the interview I did with Gino Wickman, uh, who wrote Traction. Check that interview out. Uh, also, the interview I did with Mark Winters, who co-authored Rocket Fuel with Gino Wickman. Both of them are fantastic books, and check out those individual episodes. Also, episode with Todd Tasky, and he talks about um, selling your agency. He basically helps agencies uh, sell and all the different things of what goes into that. So check that out for any agency who's not thinking of selling. It's still important because it's all the systems and processes you put in place that makes it attractive to a seller. So check that episode out and many more on Inspired Insider. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We help you run your podcast. You know, for me, Kevin, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And over the past decade, I've found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I most admire. If I read a book, I'm like, this was amazing. I get to ask the questions I'm wondering as I'm reading the book from those authors. You talk about Chris Voss, I've never split the difference. You know, like, what would he say to this? And I invite him on and let them shout from the rooftops what they're working on and from their business. So if you've thought about podcasting and you have a business, I believe you should. Just like you have a website, you call Kevin and his team to build you one. Um, I believe every business should and will have a podcast. So if you've thought about it, you can have you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us. We're happy to answer them. Support at rise25.com. And today I have Kevin Horrigan. He's president of Spinia Tech. Um, he founded Bayshore Solutions in 1996, and he's delivered uh, websites and custom web applications to thousands and thousands of clients in over 54 countries. And he's been doing it for over 25 years, if you could believe that, if you think back to the internet and uh, how long the internet's been around. Um, and he's led Bayshore Solutions and Spinia Tech through growth and change uh, to a leading end-to-end digital agency. Kevin, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it, Jeremy. I look forward to it. Bring me back a little bit to 1996. And I know that you started it from scratch. You grew it. It shrunk. You grew it. Take me a little bit back to the the original, um, you know, starting in the company. Sure, I think you know. Um, I think you know. Back in January nineteen ninety six, um, maybe one one and a half percent of companies had a website at that time, and so at that time we had another company that was what you call today an IT integrator or managed services provider, but we were going into people's local businesses and helping manage their their servers that used to be in a closet in their office and workstations that were connected by cable to, to those servers. And we were their outsourced IT department. And in that journey of managing their, their, their network and their, and their infrastructure, uh, we had one of our engineers who really liked, you know, building websites very early on. And, and so he had convinced me to ask if we could build their website. And so the ask Jeremy was, is would you like a website? And the first response we got consistently over and over again is either what is a website or we'll never need one of the hoes. And so you know, very early on, we were marketing a product to a company who wasn't aware of the need for that product right yet. And that's, that's a, a tough whole, one. That's a whole other, you know, that's a, but, but it was probably about, when this started in 1995, and probably about six to nine months later, some of those customers started calling back and said, hey, could you send John that engineer out? We're thinking about that website thing that he was talking about, and we might need one of those. But it was a simple three-page website for $500, and you know that's how we got started. Um, as, as 1996 started to, to move on, consumer awareness started to become there, that commercial awareness, I should say, started to become aware that, hey, this website thing is probably something we need to think about. And then, you know, what was a $500 three-page website started to become a $5,000 10-page website, and the evolution went on. 
We started in 1996 with three team members. And by 1998, we had grown to 30. But then this thing called the dot-com bubble that we didn't know was going to happen started to happen. And we went from 30 team members to 225 by the time year 2000 happened. And then that dot-com bubble burst and we went from 225 down to under 20 team members. And that journey from 30 to 225 back down to a 20, you know, took place in probably about a two and a half year window of time. And, you know, people ask like, you know, how did that happen? Well, it grew like crazy because everybody think they needed the best website ever or were trying to outspend each other. And there's a lot of investment capital into great ideas that really weren't thoroughly thought through. And then in, in March of 2000, the NASDAQ crashed. And when that crashed, the capital that was fueling all these startup businesses disappeared. And shortly after that, we had to send our existing customers who were delinquent and paying their invoices if they couldn't get current, we we're going to, have to terminate services. And probably 90% of our customer base could not get current. And so what was funny is, is going back to, there's nothing funny about it. Some of the experience gained is in, in, in 1996, our average project was $500. In 1998, it was $5,000. In 2000, in the year 2000, it was $216,000. When it went back to 2002, it was back to about $15,000 again. And it was, it seemed the reflection in the rearview mirror was it was easy for people to spend that $216,000 when it wasn't their money. But when it was back to people who were spending their own money for a known need to help them support their business for its current stage or maybe one or two steps forward, but not this leapfrog, you know, swinging for the rafters and then some, it went much more to a disciplined spend with the disciplined expectations of what they're going to get back in return. And that's how we survived. Our core clients who got started with us didn't go away, but the ones who were swinging for the rafters with, you know, capital that wasn't theirs were the ones, unfortunately, who didn't survive. And, and as a result of that, as those clients left, a lot of our team had to leave as well. Were you, um, I know some of the dot-com companies were looking at going public at that time. Was there any of that talk with you? Yes, yeah, we had, we had to gauge Deutsche Bank. We had filed our S1. We were marching down Wall Street when the NASDAQ crashed. We were probably within 20 days of taking our own company public. And so, um, you know, that was a um, soup of the day, if you would, of what companies in our space would do. And, and we were being approached, you know, for a year and a half prior to just, you know, you're a company that should be going public and all of those types of things. I, I think there's a statistic in our, in our industry, Jeremy, that only 2% of the companies in the internet services space before year 2000 are still in business today. I think had we gone public, we'd be one of those casualties that wasn't able to navigate what we needed to do to be able to reposition the business as quickly as we were able to do so with maybe public scrutiny of being a public company and the scrutiny and expectations there, I think we would have been one of the casualties. Fortunately, we ended up being one of the, the 2% who survived. You know, Ken, I was talking to another agency owner and, you know, telling them a bit of your story. I didn't know the full story. And they were like, you got to ask him, why did he continue? Right. Because going from 225 to 20, I'm sure a lot of business is like, this is not for me. I'm done. This is too stressful. Um, talk about, take me back to that time. You know, it's a blip right now when you look at the timeline, but at that time, everything came crashing down. Absolutely. And, and you know, people who, who know me probably say that I have an element of tenacity to me and, and I don't tap out easy. But uh, when we were when we were going public, the company did bring on um, some angel investors. And um, there was a point where I said to them, listen, guys, I don't think your money is going to end up in a good result. And I recommend that we potentially consider, you know, stopping this right now, because the last thing I want you to continue to invest money into this business that I don't think is going to have a good return for you. I, I don't stand for that. And I would, I would hate to feel taken advantage. And, and, and quite honestly, I had an exit in a prior business not too soon before all of that. And I, I, was, I was in a situation where I didn't need to work either. And I just was open and honest with the investors. And um, they uh, said, let us, let us huddle and we'll get back to you tomorrow. And I'll never forget this is a classic line. I'll never forget this. Um, but I come back and they said, hey, Kevin, you know, we, we had a conversation. And um, we know Kevin Horrigan's not a quitter. And we're in for the long haul. And I'll never forget that line. I, I even chuckled when he said it. I said, that's a classic. Like, I'm going to borrow that sometime down the road. Um, but they said, no, we want to see this thing through. We think that you guys have something there. And it may not be what we started off with. I think what we started will never happen. But we believe in you and we believe in the team and we believe in the company. 
and um, and we want to see this through. And so, um, you know, I was ready to tap out. I was ready to say this is, you know, bad investment that isn't going to pan out. Fortunately, many years down the road, I was able to buy those investors out, and we all had a good, um, you know, we had a good run, and uh, and and they had the foresight to stick it through a little bit longer than I was, you know, than I was willing to consider. But when they said they were in, and we had good expectations, known of each other, you know, we did it, and we got back to being tenacious, and we found our way out of it, and you know, slowly we grew back. You know, we, you know, probably, you know, we went from down to less than twenty people. Probably less than three years later, we're back at fifty people again, and you know, we've grown and. We'd found out what, you know, we found out who we serve and why we serve them, what value we bring to them, and, and it was back to having fun again. Talk about the timeline, the evolution of the services there, right? Because you started off with IT. Yes. Do you still do any IT? No, no, no that business, um, we ended up exiting out of that business um, in 1996. And so seeing the vision of what the, the digital side was going to be um, versus what, you know, and, and so fortunate that had that opportunity too, because, you know, servers were no longer going to be in people's offices anymore, running cables, you know, all that stuff was on its way out either. Didn't know that at the time, but that business model was going to have to be significantly evolved and become a true managed services provider and things of that nature. But we just went full steam into being a web design, web development and in web hosting company in 1996, 97, 98. You know, 1999, the marketing side came around with, you know, like AOL and things of that nature. And it certainly then it evolved into, you know, some more of the more common companies that we know of today that were, were, were in the app channels that we market in today. But, you know, the heartbeat of it really started as a web design and web development company who, oh, by the way, hosted the websites as a convenience to our clients. And then digital marketing services started to build into the services level as soon as um, they started to, to open up those doors. And you know, search engine optimization was the primary component of it. And then paid media came along and things of that nature. You know, we were talking before we hit record here and um, about the digital agency of the future, yes. right? And um, you had a merger 18 months ago. I feel like your journey is always just continuing to grow, 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 grow. And you're always seeing what's the next step for you to grow even more sustainably. Yes. Talk about that decision of the merger and that, you know, we'll, that we'll get into the digital agency of the future. Sure. You know, Jeremy, I think for 26 years, people ask me, what's the vision of, of your company? And I think they're asking me to, to speculate about where search engine optimization is going to be or where Google's going to be or Facebook or TikTok or whatever it might be. I've never stood on the thin limb to predict three years from now where we're spending our clients' money and our people's time. I've never took the liberty to stand on that thin limb three years out. But I've said this for 25 plus years, we're going to remain digital experts at a level here where the normal companies that we work for knowledge is here. And as long as we've maintained that digital expertise to help them grow their business, that's quite a few steps ahead of theirs. That's the vision of where our agency is going to be. It's maintain that expertise at a higher level um, because we're just focused that that's our core vertical of what we do and serve people who don't have that. And, and there's an old saying, outsource what you're not an expert at. We're that export. We're that expert that our companies, that our customers want to outsource that service to. And I always really like, you know, we have a CPA, we have lawyers, we have all those things. We can file our own tax returns. We can represent ourselves for any legal situation, no differently than any company could choose to do their own digital. But we choose to pay someone else because we believe that that investment will have a better return on investment than doing that ourselves. And that's what our vision is of, of well, the agency of the future, continuing to have that level of knowledge over and above where the majority of people who, who need the services are and continue to provide value to them and helping them accomplish what their goals are at a level of expertise north of what theirs is. So the decision of the merger, what came, how did that come about? So it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was an easy decision to understand why. And that is, we have been trying to become what I call an end-to-end -end digital partner to our customers. And end-to-end -end means their copywriting, their web design, their social media advertising design, complex web development, web hosting, and then all the different all the different iterations of what uh, digital marketing would be, and digital continues to just grow so quickly. It's growing more broadly, and the need for skill is growing more deeply. Our team of sixty five people, we could check the box of being end to end digital in a couple of those boxes. And then we could say maybe in a light pencil we could check one, 
And then maybe the next view, that would be in a roadmap. We're trying to get all of those. But to be the end end digital partner, you need a company with scale. It just needs, it needs, it needs enough team members who are experts in all these different components, what end end digital is. And in knowing that my partner Mark for four years before our merger, his company had taken a stronger um, march into more complex digital advertising than my company Bayshore Solutions is. And our DNA started as a web design, web development company, and that DNA had not left us. And we had some more complex capabilities and some different platforms that we had built websites with a lot of experience in. And so we looked at, you know, as we looked at partnering together and knowing each other very well for, for, for four years and starting to compete against each other a little bit, like, gosh, if we came to, if we came to some of these opportunities as one company and check the box on all the website things and check the box on all the digital marketing wouldn't that be a greater value to the customers? And we started to say, yeah, I think it would. And then we said internally, like for our team members, we want to create a great career path for our team members. What if we have really can expand all these services that these are new career path choices that you have now today post-merger than it would be trying to figure out how to get there and thought, gosh, it's creating a better career path. And then we thought we're building a better company because we're serving our clients better by maybe eliminating some partners that they need to do all of their digital and building an end-to-end shop with an integrated methodology of all those services under one roof, as opposed to hiring multiple different partners who never worked together before, who try to figure it out, who really don't want to work together, who love to take any market share of overlap of services from that brand. And often they help get that market share to them because they help the other company fail. It's not good for the brand, but it's good for them to acquire the business. And so we saw the opportunity here. It's better for our clients. It's better for our coworkers, and we're going to have more fun as a company serving it. And so the logic behind that became, you know, pretty easy to get excited and rallied around. And, and we had an opportunity to take that to market just before the merger, less than a month before the merger. We had an opportunity to pre-leak to a prospect that we were putting this together because we were having an opportunity to win one side of the digital, but there's, the other side was going to go to another part, another company, and the other company was going to win it, only wanted it all or didn't want any of it. And so the brand said, gosh, I can't believe these people are going to turn down half the business. And we've leaked like we're about to be one company that can do both sides of this. And it validated out and we were able to earn that opportunity. And so taking that live just shortly before pre-merger um, was you know, just another validation that not only we thought this through and, and checked with some of our trusted, um, trusted relationships if to validate or, or shoot holes or blind spots in what we were trying to do to be able to walk away with the new client partnership based on the value proposition of being a broader end end agency with deeper skill sets across the board um, and earn that opportunity was a great validation. I want to talk about navigating the merger. If an agency came to you, Kevin said, um, I'm going to be going through this in a couple of months. What advice would you have for them? And what do you, what are some of the lessons you learned from navigating the merger? Yeah, I think I, you know, everyone has their own opinions and things like that. I think usually just in, in, in three different buckets, but they all have to be equally served. What does this mean for the clients? Why is this the win for the clients? Why is this the win for the coworkers? How does this benefit the team? And how does this benefit the new company? And all of those need to be very positive and very related. What's the new story? What's the purpose? Who do we serve? How does it make everybody better? If it only serves one of those entities or two of those entities, there's going to be a disappointed entity. And when there's a disappointed entity, there's risk of a, of a merger with friction and frustration. But if we really believe and we validate, not just take our, not just breathe our own exhaust on these things, but validate um, through some outside trusted relationships, this is a benefit for our clients. This is a benefit for our coworkers. This is a benefit for our company. And culturally, everyone gels. We are fortunate in our merger. Our leadership teams had a chance to meet each other before the merger in a way to support two agencies trying to help provide support to each other and sharing learning lessons. My partner, Mark, and I were in a YPO forum for four years prior to the merger. So we spent a half day a month um, helping each other grow. And then we spent an hour every week supporting each each other again. So we had very deep relationships we decided we trusted each other well enough to start to let what we were benefiting from that to our leadership team. And, and shortly after the feedback from our team saying we both thought each other were really nice and really smart and very complimentary, it made it very easy to see that there was an opportunity our coworkers would benefit, our clients would benefit, and we think we're a better agency as a result of it. And so I just say, you know, evaluate those things. 
there's always the financial component of it too. Um, I think, you know, if, if the agency principal, you know, what do you see your future role is? Are you active? Are you inactive? Um, if you are active, is your role defined? How are you going to gel with the new culture? Um, agency owners, you know, can come a lot, you know, often with a lot of personality um, or a you know, strong personality. And how's that going to um, integrate with the you know, new company and things of that nature? Um, and, and I'm always happy with any of those agency owners to share any experiences too, if they'd ever want to connect offline. But I think you really have to see how's this a benefit to the customer? How's it a benefit to the coworker? How's it a benefit to the company? Are they equal all beneficial so everyone feels well served? And I think it should go pretty well after that. I'd love to hear how your role changed. Um, yeah. I mean, not saying you answered anyone now, but like you're used to running the company, making all the decisions. And when you merge, you have other, you know, a CEO or someone from another company. So how did your role change in this merger? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an evolving journey. I think my partner, Mark and I are 50, 50 co-managing partners. Um, but pre-merger, we decided how to split that 50, 50, very important decisions. We'd both weigh in and make that decision jointly together. Um, this, but then we decided to diversify because his company had gone deeper into the digital marketing. He'd still act as an executive thought leader in digital marketing and vice versa. I would do that in complex web design and web development components. And so teams looking for support from an executive level would know where they could go there. Um, my partner, Mark, is, is an amazing person focused on culture within the organization. And I'm a very strong numbers guy. And so it's very easy to see how to complement a great company has to have an amazing culture and then has to have great financials. And so we're able to figure out too um, where our organic path and where we, what we like to do was very complimentary because these things were making a great company, but both of us saw where our experience was on, on a different side of it. And so, you know, we've learned, I mean, fortunately for us, it fit like a, you know, fit like a glove for us. And then I think, you know, over the, the, the year, Jeremy, we learned that it'd be important for us not to share our own individual viewpoints unless they were consistent um, and, and, not, and not conflicting because it was difficult for the team to understand where to go. So we've learned that, you know, when we um, see things from different perspectives, which usually those two perspectives can create one amazing perspective, we have those conversations and we eventually deliver one voice, but not but one that we both believe in and are excited about, but not one that's of, of, conflicting direction to the team and not knowing where, you know, what to make, make of all of that. Um, and so, you know, that journey has been fun. Um, uh, it's been enjoyable to look to see how to develop new team members and to taking on some of the different responsibilities and things of that nature. Um, uh, you know, still you know, building relationships with new customers, um, partnering with vendors and stuff is something both Mark and I still enjoy quite, doing quite a bit. Um, but really, instead of making a decision for everything, it was really kind of splitting some of those decisions and he taking on the cultural side, the digital marketing side, and me taking on more of the operations and on finance and legal and, and web design and web development and trusting each other to do a great job. And, and fortunately we have that great trust of each other. Sounds like uh, you complement each other really well. It's, it's lucky because I think, you know, in our discussions prior to really getting deep into the, the merger discussion, those weren't things we had thought through it just felt like the assets of what my company was in his building one better agency of the future, you know, all, all, all seemed like a great reason. And, and oh, by the way, we started to figure out what our roles were going to be and how that complemented later. But that wasn't part of our early discussions, it was more discovery at the tail end of our discussions. You know, I could see someone who's, um, you know, maybe in the culture, I don't know if this is the case with both of you, be like, listen, it stresses me out or it, it actually drains my energy to think about the numbers and operations. And he's like, Kevin, I'm glad I have you. Do you consider yourself when we talk about rocket fuel? I know you're from, you know, Gina Wickman's traction. Are you more of a visionary or more of an integrator or how do, how do you break down as a, as a leader as far as that goes? So today um, we use Mark as our visionary. Uh, I sit in what's called the owner's box. And so um, very number scorecard driven. Um, and then we have an integrator uh, that works with us as well. Mm. I want to talk about the role progressions. You mentioned something exciting about a merger is there's a now that the career path changes. Yes. What was the role like when you built out the role progressions and career path with uh, Bayshore Solutions? What did that look like? And then what does it look like after 
the merger? Yeah, so I think, you know, again, um, we, now that we're, we've merged, the former Bayshore Solutions now has more digital advertising capabilities than it had when it was just Bayshore Solutions. And we might have people that we used to work for Bayshore Solutions who were aspiring to maybe take on some of those skill sets that Bayshore Solutions might eventually have gotten to, but didn't have available right out of the gate. And vice versa with, 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 with Spinia Tech. It was an opportunity for them to have some opportunities to take their career path, um, maybe in some of the areas that Bayshore Solutions was further advanced in. And so in, in being able to say the new co now has all, all of these service areas with all these skill needs, many of those were new to the two companies coming into this. They knew that probably each company was trying to get there, um, but now, now we're there. And now that path to be able to diversify what your career path might be by taking on some different um, trainings and things of that nature to diversify your skill set, maybe pick a different career path was now available to them. You know, in the smaller agencies, when, you know, someone is 10 or 20 people, as opposed to 50, 60, 100, 200 people, you know, people are doing the work there. And how do you decide to move someone into leadership? Um, or do you have outside? You know, I feel like in the beginning, it's kind of a flat organization, and then you start putting right. layers in. At what point do you start putting layers in? I don't know if it's a company, you know, revenue or team member size that you're like, okay, we need someone managing these people and how you move them up. Because some people, I imagine, like doing the skill. Some people, you know, may see, you see that management potential. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I tell you, I don't, I don't think that's never not evolving and, and improving. Um, but this is one of the things too, just from thinking from a team member perspective, what the merger meant. It meant new layers of management that didn't exist in the prior two companies. And a lot of that management was elevated up from the, the, the teams that merged together. So as those companies were smallly apart, the layers of management that we have today didn't exist. And so, you know, there's all kinds of new management opportunities, many filled within, a few maybe um, hired from, from without. But, um, you know, again, I think some of the model of how to go about that is, is leveraging traction, right? So we leverage traction. Um, everybody has an accountability um, and they know who, you know, they know what's responsible for them. They know what their measurables are and they know who, you know, helps is their coach and their boss, so to speak. And so, you know, traction has what's called the accountability chart. And, you know, very early on our traction journey was putting together that accountability chart. And then that evolved as the company's grown and uh, created new layers of, of management and, and, and really new roles within the agency itself. And so, you know, that accountability chart is something that we look at at a quarterly basis and continue to evolve it. But um, certainly as a new company, it created, you know, a significantly different accountability chart than it had independently before in quite a few areas of, of new leaders to be developed in the company. You know, you don't have to name names here, Kevin, but um, <clears throat> can you think of a person in like the different roles that they started off and where they ended up? Meaning like, oh, they started as a junior web developer, then they moved to senior, then they moved to project. I'm just, just to get a little granular with it, who's someone we can think, oh, here's the trajectory they actually took and now they're senior project manager, I don't know, whatever it is. Yeah, and I, th I think that there's quite a few of those case studies to celebrate. Um, and, you know, and it's one of the most proud things of, of being a business owner is seeing the development of your team. And so I, I just had a discussion with one of our team members yesterday who is going through a personal event. I don't want to say it because it's confidential and secret, but it's a, an amazing personal event that I'm excited. Um, I'm excited when I hear about someone buying their first house, getting married, having their first child. Um, but a lot of these things are a byproduct of their career growth within the company too, and the ability to go buy their first house and things of that nature. And so, you know, I would tell you that we've probably, you know, promoted probably 25 to 35 people in the first 18 months of, of our journey together. And probably at least a few have gone through multiple promotions and it's great to see people progressing in that journey. And, um, in allowing us the opportunity to pay, create that path for them to be able to do so. And, and hopefully, you know, delighting our clients and, and be delighted with the team that they're doing it with. And, you know, with delighted clients and a team who loves working together and doing great results, it helps us build a great agency. Do you remember, like, uh, as far as, you know, this person is now, whatever their position is, can you take me through that path? Like, what were they when they started? 
And then what were the positions? I'm just curious of what actually their their progression was of the, okay, here's where they started. And then here's the positions they went through uh, in the company. So we have, um, we, we, have a, we have a very talented individual who started out as, as an office administrator for us, um, who now today runs all of our inside sales, um, still managing office responsibilities and many of the other tasks, but leads our inside sales and absolutely crushes it. And um, you know, this person's um, this person I have a nickname for um, because there's times sometimes we doubt we're able to do the next thing that maybe is being considered. And um, and we've been had many conversations about um, with the right training and the right attitude, you, know, you can do anything you want. And this person's just literally, you know, probably doubled their income here at the agency. Um, and double it quadrupled the responsibility. Um, and it's just so enjoyable to see someone come in with the one set of expectations to go in a direction they never, ever, ever, ever would have chosen to come work for our company had they known they're going to be in the role they are today. Never. They would have been scared to death and absolutely said it wasn't a role for them today. But, you know, creating this agency of the future and all these new career paths and things of this nature and with the right training um, and, and the right attitude, people can do things that maybe they didn't think of before. And I think this person would say that, you know, they're overjoyed at what they've been able to learn, shocked that they were able to do it, surprised, proud of themselves, um, very happy. Um, and it's helped them, you know, grow in their career. It's helped them, you know, be able to support their family better. And, you know, it's a great journey to, to watch someone come in at, at that level and now, you know, lead, lead a, a, a very important service area at the company. You know, with that situation, Kevin, I mean, you say this person is an office administrator, this person is a rock star, we want to move them up and have them take on more responsibility. Was it where they were doing the office administration and you immediately put them into an inside sales or was there some progression of other things they did within, within the inside sales before they kind of headed it up? I think it's you know, someone who was uh, in office administration, front desk clerk, answering the telephone, greeting guests as they came into, into the agency, that type of role, who has some downtime in between phone calls and guests coming in and things of that nature. And so you start to think about, you know, well, could you help utilize some of that downtime for, for everyone's sake? You know, I think a lot of people don't want to not, you know, don't want to be bored at work, right? And so you start to look at ways and, 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 and they have a positive attitude and a glass full approach. And so you have to say, listen, you like we could maybe use a little bit of help here and here. And, and literally this person started doing accounting for us. Literally was doing our deposits, was doing accounts receivable. Um, literally was doing things like, like never, ever, ever when they took that role that they think they'd have an accounting responsibility. And then we say, okay, can you shift over here to some of the inside sales things? And then you know, we're a company who uses HubSpot as a platform to manage our own CRM and, and, and marketing automation. And I've um, become HubSpot certified numerous times over my career, and I think HubSpot's training is absolutely top notch. And uh, you know, this person we asked to take on a couple of responsibilities that HubSpot would be the platform, and they went through some of that training. And um, I, you know, I think they enjoyed what they were learning, and they were able to put it to work, and they were able to see the results, like the, the impact they saw it when they were helping us in accounting and get deposits paid faster, getting invoices to clients who needed them. Um, things of that nature, they, they saw the impact that they were making and how it was helping the agency. And, and when we asked them to consider shifting over here, they, they could see how we were performing better. And I think that's, re, I think that's the, the career reward that team members get when they see that their activity is actually making a difference. And again, they would have never, ever signed up for the role to do accounting or to do inside sales, um, but crushed it both ways and had no prior experience in either one, zero prior experience. But again, a glass full attitude and and a desire to help and some some bandwidth of their schedule. And you know, we were able to develop, you know, it's a great example of someone developing to have a senior role within our company today, starting out answering the phones at, at our agency. Yeah. It's exciting for them probably to see all of the skill sets they've gained because of just doing it slowly but surely getting the training. You mentioned the accountability chart. And so I'm wondering how. How do you use EOS as a company? Yeah, so um, we uh, try to stay. Our, we have a, we have a I, we have an EOS integrator, um, and uh, he uses the name. He uses the term pure EOS. What does that mean? It's probably very subjective to many people who hear the phrase pure EOS. But I think the intent of that is is to stay as close to the book as possible and to the teachings as possible, and not try to derive your own system. 
in, in my experience, Jeremy, I've been around a lot of companies who, who, who practice EOS, um, but they haven't decided who the integrator and the visionary is going to be. So they claim they're doing EOS, but they're not following the principles. I've been through many who, you know, maybe do only one L10 within their company, don't use the accountability chart, things of that nature. And so while they, um, they claim they're doing EOS, it's such a light version. And often in my experience with these brands, the reason they haven't gone deeper is the decisions needed to be made to take EOS to the next level and the next level and the next level are not easy. They're not gonna be fun, but it's those decisions that are holding them back. It's those decisions why they decided to go to EOS in the first place, but they haven't stayed committed to be able to make those decisions. And so um, we as a company want to leverage what over 80,000 companies are, many who are operating very well, and not try to follow an operating system that Mark and I created on our own, but one proven by over 80,000 companies out there, and use that as our operating system. And I joke before we went into the EOS, I had asked our leadership team if they would read the book and we would decide a month from now if we were going to follow the EOS. And um, we voted, we were all unanimous to do so. But I said prior to the EOS, we were following the KOS. Have you ever been through that operating system before? <laughs> no. No one has. It's called the Kevin operating system. And no one's written a book about it yet. It'd be a horror story and a nightmare. <laughs> but we're getting off the KOS, so to speak. And you know, making that, make, you know, make it, making it as we go, so to speak, and but instead leveraging a framework that over eighty thousand companies are using very successfully, and you know, wanting to graduate from the the the, the joking KOS into the EOS, it's like, listen, this has been perfected by many many companies. Let's not believe we're smarter than all the research that's been done here, and let's just be disciplined to following this with an implementer holding us accountable to following it as pure as we can go, and not try to deviate from the system. There's going to be no perfect system out there, and there's many systems that compete with the OS and probably could get similar results. Just pick one and be good at the one that you pick, and that's the decision we made. What's an example you mentioned? There's a bunch of hard decisions you have to make as you're going through the EOS process. What's an example of a hard decision that, yeah. that you and the team had to make? I think you know the most difficult ones are are regarding the team. Um, you know, there's 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 yeah, I love decisions that are black or white because they make the decisions for themselves. Decisions that are gray, everyone sees the shade of gray differently. And I think when it comes around people, it can be very subjective. So who should be the head of this team? Well, there could be someone who has the best skill in that area, but, but has no leadership experience or has the best skill, but has demonstrated they don't like leadership. Now, so you have one who, who wants leadership, but maybe isn't as good in the skill Another one who's amazing in the skill, but has either demonstrated they're not good leaders or said they don't want to be a leader. So who becomes the head of that accountability chart? It becomes a difficult question to answer, um, but certainly the person with the skill who doesn't want to do it probably shouldn't do it, but they may feel disrespected that they're not the head of the chart. And so I think the hardest parts about making some of these decisions about you know, who goes in what seat, so to speak, because for sure, there's going to be people who are excited about the seat they're being asked to take. And absolutely, there's going to be people disappointed. Um, and, and so it's, you know, making those decisions that have a lot of human emotion about them are, 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 are not fun at all. But by not making those decisions, um, it's also probably holding everyone back. Those two people, you know, hypothetically in that situation, they don't know who's leader. They may be they're jockeying to be leader by being intentionally aggressive and trying to be leader or maybe disruptive and trying to make the other one fail and things of that nature. It's not healthy for anyone involved. And it, but it, but that's what might just state if you don't make those decisions um, and then, you know, ride with those benefits, but there's consequences too. Some people may feel so disrespected. They don't want to be part of the organization anymore and feel and so, you know, they're, they're not fun decisions to make whatsoever, but I think probably the most difficult decisions that involve people. Yeah. Kevin, I want to give people an idea of exactly what you and the company do at Spin U Tech. And if anyone is, wants to check it out, go to Spin U Tech. It's S P I N U T E C H dot com. You help a lot of different industries from agriculture to associations to credit unions to e commerce to education to finance and banking, healthcare, et cetera. Um, and I'd love to talk about um, e-commerce for a second. Sure. Um, obviously, that's uh, growing and it's a hot topic. And one of the companies that you you worked with, and Nop Commerce, and how what you did for them. Yeah, so so Nop Commerce is an e-commerce platform that we build a lot of very complex websites on. And 
And um, you know, Jeremy, I think as an, as an agency, the e-commerce that we help provide for our clients is, is very complex, very customized, very deeply integrated into companies' ERP, accounting, inventory, very customized business rules for very complex um, uh, e-commerce solutions. And one of the platforms we build a lot of is, is the Not Commerce platform. Um, and so from a web design, web development perspective, we have a large team that specializes in, in e-commerce and again, mostly complex e-commerce, helping companies who have been successful selling online, but probably have lots of opportunity to be more efficient and how it operates. And so taking the human component out of some of that stuff about the duplicate entries, multiple databases and things of that nature, and being able to get to a single source of truth from a database perspective, from an accounting perspective, and help enable the back offices of our clients to the up to the shopping cart in a very, very, very secure way um, has been something that we've been doing for 10 or 12 years and have a lot of really amazing case studies as a result. In the e-commerce world, someone's listening to this, who's an ideal client for you? Is there a size of company? What does that look like? I think an ideal e-commerce client is a company who realizes that um, they are missing out on being as efficient, as effective as possible because they started building a website that wasn't connected to a lot of the different connection points, namely accounting, inventory. And so they're probably running either multiple different databases, which are never in sync. So you never know what the right data is. Um, and that could be customer data, that could be accounting data, that could be inventory data. But it's companies who've got to that point that they built something to build as a proof of concept. That proof of concept absolutely succeeded. It grew, it grew, it grew. But now the challenges of having, again, lots of different data that doesn't sync up correctly and you don't know what the source of truth is becomes frustrating to be able to make some decisions by. And so our ideal client has been through the initial journey of being able to be successful at a proof of concept, but now wants to benefit from a completely integrated back office to their, to their e-commerce experience. I'm sure there's a lot of companies that start out and they grow and they grow and they put probably duct tape and patches on their current solution. Sure. At what point of size wise, does it make sense? We need to engage someone like you. I think you know, that I, I hate the answer. It varies, but I think it depends on the pain or opportunity of each individual company. You know, a company might be might about to be a hundred million dollars a year, but the website's only doing ten million dollars. Versus, there could be an eight million dollar pure e-commerce company that's it's just as equal of a fit. And so, you know, I really think it's more of the pain or the opportunity that results of it. The pain of you have not matching data. You have a lot of you know duplicate data entry of your administrative team having to duplicate data entry, which is usually has faults in it and cost. Um, there's opportunities to be able to sell better, either by cross-selling better or having a better opportunity to uh, present inventory better. Um, but it's the opportunity to reduce pain or increase opportunity um, and usually through the customizations of a shopping cart that usually is just like you said, Jeremy, it started out as a proof of concept. It started to add more fuel to it. So you start to continue to bolt things on. But at some point, you realize the investment of continuing to bolt things on is going to be more expensive than it is to just eventually restructure it and be able to set it up on its own stable ground going forward. I that's know you great fit for us. I know you've you know worked with companies like Pella and Bank United Direct, but there was an interesting one, uh, Panavision. Yeah, yeah. So we just launched a website for Panavision, global provider of film equipment to the to the to the cinema industry, and you know, we were talking pre-COVID, and then you just talk about it's it's amazing how many companies that we serve and how COVID affected so many, but, you know, the cinemas, you know, the, the, the movie studios, you know, they've been, you know, essentially kind of shut down for the most part in, in, in pre-COVID. Um, but we just launched some, uh, something for, for, for Panavision that it's a, it's a, it's a website with a global audience. Um, and uh, we built it in the Sitefinity platform, lots of integration. Um, there's a e-commerce like component where you can find product. You can get a quote on that product. You don't actually check out with a credit card. Um, but it's an, an amazing global website with an amazing team at Panavision who had the courage to know that in a, in a new COVID world, this website was needed. And uh, we just launched that probably less than two months ago. And I enjoy anybody to go take a look at it. It's panavision.com. But it's an amazing global experience of a brand who uh, knew, knew they'd operate in, in a different capacity, whatever the new COVID world would look like, and, and had the courage to go out there and, and, and build something. And they did a great job. Kevin, last question. And first of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing the journey and the stories. And everyone can check out uh, spinutech.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast. 
Now, you have offices all over, you know, of Iowa, Illinois, um, Denver, Tampa. I wonder if you can just give us one or a couple things that you do culturally that helps, again, in this virtual world, you have also offices all over the place, and we're in this, you know, virtual working world as well. What do you do as a company that helps with the culture? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So as a company of about 165 team members across five offices today, we still haven't uh, asked our com- our coworkers to come back to work. Um, we're optional today in those five offices with the 165 team members. I would bet we'd have somewhere between 25 and 35 people a day maybe go in, 20 to 35 people a day go in, except for days we have an intentional event that may attract people to come in. We have what we call an all team meeting, which is you know a town hall meeting or a staff meeting. And we serve lunch on those days for people to come in. We do see a good a good amount of people come in for that day. They like to interact. Um, we have one person uh, within our organization dedicated to serving the team and the culture and making a great experience there. And she does a great job of creating all kinds of different events online and in person. But we have so many different flavors of activity that people here on the team like um, that she's created all these different kinds of Slack channels, events. We have we have yoga, we have meditation, we have workouts, we have channels for different types of pets, children, all kinds of things that we facilitate to try to provide that what used to be the water cooler talk that you're not getting today, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a digital world um, and still trying to have fun events online. You know, I think, you know, when COVID started, it was the, the happy, the virtual happy hours, you know, those we haven't really held that much of so much and just try to be more activity driven. But you know, we're trying to provide a new COVID-like remote work experience by intentionally creating some events that might attract people to come into the office that isn't necessarily work-related. Certainly have some um, customer events that drive people to come into the office. Um, and then certainly trying to figure out from a virtual perspective how to be able to get our whole team connected because now we have a significant number of team members who don't live anywhere close to the vicinity of office and don't have the opportunity to do that as well. So it's a hybrid of all three of those things and trying to navigate what um, you know what an agency of the future looks like in uh, in the COVID world in the stage of where we're at today. Kevin, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Check out spinyatech.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.